Hey guys, welcome to Devour, the podcast for the hungry entrepreneur. On today's weekly podcast, I have the pleasure of speaking to Mr. Marcus Collins, cultural contagion and mini maker practitioner. He's a clinical marketing professor at the Ross School of Business, University of Michigan. He also holds a position at an agency based out of New York called White and Kennedy as a, a head of strategy. You're gonna to wanna to stick around till the end of this one because we'll be tackling things such as his experience working with industry giants such as Apple and Nike, entertainers are like Beyonce, and the power behind signal meaning when it comes to branding. But like people are really predictable, really, really, really predictable. Um, and if you understand the governing operating system that is culture, that influences or informs how they behave in the world and how the environment influences how they show up in the world man like it's a really powerful thing so make sure you stick around till the end this is a good one hey what's up guys today we have marcus collins joining us on the podcast um, he's a clinical marketing professor at the university of michigan he's worked with brands such as budweiser the new york nets nike apple beyonce Jeep, Pepsi, Nescafe, Google, and Amazon, just to name a few out of his alumni. He's spoken at events such as TEDx, Google, and Cairns. Um, some of the topics that you like to discuss, Marcus, is consumer behavior, brand marketing, and something that you've somewhat created yourself, which is cultural contagion, which I'd love to dive into. And also, you're the head of planning at Wyden and Kennedy, which is a massive, massive agency based out of New York. Um, but to kick things off, where, where did this all come from? Like, how did you even start this journey? Uh, to, to where you are now. <laughs> Man, if I had the answer, I'd tell you, uh, you know, it's uh, none of this was, was predestined. You know, I, I didn't start off in advertising or, or marketing. In fact, my, uh, my undergraduate work at university, I was an engineer. I did materials engineering, focusing on polymers, uh, you know, carbon chains. And while I was doing those things, I really wanted to write music. I played, played in jazz bands and sang in singing groups and play piano in church, sing in choir. So I always wanted to be a musician. In my heart of hearts, I wanted to be the fifth member of Boys to Men that never worked out. But oh, that was the dream. That was the dream. So close. <laughs> yeah. Did you ever so, meet them? Did you ever spend time with you them? You know what? I did meet them. I met yeah, them. Uh, I did. It was it was like a, at a green room, uh, like meet and greet thing. It was all of 20 seconds and it broke my heart. So I was like, I am like your number one fan. I didn't say that. Yeah. Like fan play out too much but uh there were it felt very transactional which kind of sucked was truthfully. was that early days no this was actually later days so you think that like they'd be more like you know grateful for having fans uh but <laughs> no, kind of like eh, thanks take a picture yeah. keep it moving uh, I, I, wanted to I guess at some, at some point yeah at some point maybe it's a lot of noise but yeah you wanted to be a musician and and um you know you ended up you know being in the industry at least i guess you know being able to work with people like jay-z and beyonce which is kind of cool well, but, yeah. Um, so I, I I started off. Uh, I did a startup that was oh doing okay until it wasn't because the music industry is is uh, unforgiving in a lot of ways. So I went back to school to get my MBA and sort of figure things out. And when I graduated, I went to go work at Apple doing partner marketing at iTunes, managing our relationship with with uh, Nike Sports Music. So I worked a lot with Nike at that time. And after my time at Apple, I went to do uh, to run digital strategy for Beyonce. So never worked for Jay Z directly. Though I worked through his one of the agencies that he uh, co-founded called Translation. Yeah. But I worked I worked directly with Beyonce. Uh, That's digital awesome. Strategy for her. Yeah, we're like orbiting around Jay Z, but you know. Let's, yeah, exactly. let's be real. <laughs> Beyonce, exactly. that's the, you know nothing really gets gets higher than that in entertainment. So, um, but yeah, how how did you like? How did you? What was the moment for you where you decided that um, you know music was something that was I guess can continue again going to be a passion of yours? But then you started to really lean into um, the music space. Like obviously, you, you had a startup, and then something happened. But like, what point did you realize that, hey, music is is going to take a backseat. I'm really going to pursue um, marketing, branding and, and, and working with um, these big corporations? Well, for me, marketing and branding was going to be the back door to the music industry. I mean, essentially, okay. I was writing and producing music like that was a songwriter and producer. Uh, and that's really what I wanted to do. And I saw that that was becoming hard to manage uh, to, to make a living, truthfully. Uh, I was like, what, 26 years old, 27 years old, looking at my life like, dude, this is shambles. Man. What am I doing? You know, this isn't, this isn't working. Um, I figured, well, maybe I can work on the business side and then, you know, backdoor my way into uh, 
getting a deal or getting an opportunity to, to write and produce. So that's why I went to business school to understand the disruption that was happening in the industry that is digital as we know it. Um, mm. And I went to business school with the mind of, I want to work at Apple, period. Like that's why I'm going to business school. Wow. Um, and so now I'm at Apple. This is the, the, the primary place where people were going to purchase music. I mean, Apple rewrote the rules for the industry, completely disrupted the industry. Um, and while I was there, I felt like I was so far away from the content creation yeah. that I just felt like too far down the value chain, uh, truthfully. So when I started work with Beyonce, I was like, oh, this is great. I'm on the marketing uh, and brand side, really close to the artist who's making the music. And, you know, maybe I could get a, an opportunity to make music for myself. And so what I saw, truthfully, is that Beyonce at the time was, and likely still is, the biggest artist on the planet. And the distance between her and everybody else and like how the music industry works for them or in some cases work against them, it didn't seem very compelling to me. And when wow. I looked around, you know, I had enough wherewithal that when I looked around, uh, there are people who I thought were just 20 times more talented than I was. And I was like, maybe, maybe I'm doing the wrong thing here. <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> you know, I hear stuff like, man, these guys, man, I, I didn't even think like that. Like my mind doesn't even go to that sort of that level of dopeness. And I just thought to myself, you know, well, there's people who do this better than I do. But this brand and marketing side actually do pretty well. And I get really excited about it. And in, in, in fact, the work that I do on the brand and marketing side actually touches more people than I ever did or ever could on the actual writing and producing music. So it sort of felt like more aligned with what I really wanted to do, which was to, to make connections. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, you and I, um, we, we share that in common because I myself, like I fell into branding. It wasn't a plan. Um, I just, you know, I was doing design work and I was trying to help people with their social media. And that just kind of rippled into me um, learning as much as I can about branding and developing people's brands and come up with these strategies and then deploying the marketing after the brand was built. Um, and I fell in love with it as well. And for me, it was, like you said, the connection. It's really being able to have a complicated puzzle that's different every time because every business... Yeah has a different complex set of needs and a different agenda and a different objective and a different target audience. What, what, what was it about branding that really um, got you excited and really uh, enabled you to want to jump out of bed in the morning and, and help these professionals like Beyonce grow their brands and, and, and so on? You know, to me, it was the same thing that got me excited about polymer chains, carbon chains and on the engineering side. And the same thing that got me excited about writing and producing music. It's taking things that normally are disparate and bringing them together and see what happens, right? The, the gestalt that takes place when these disparate things come together, they create this network effect. And as a marketer, I just felt like, you know, I can have a bigger dent on the world than I ever could writing in 4-4, you know, you know, like, you know, the ideas that I came up with as a marketer just seem to have more of an impact that I ever could have as a songwriter. And ultimately, if I'm just being honest with myself, I was adding up wherewithal to say like, yo, what I'm really excited about is impact, right? And music was a vehicle to do that. And, and it was great when it did, and I still miss music, you know, at least, you know, I, I, I miss how close I was to it, but like, you know, I still sing in church and I wrote an <laughs> album with my daughter during COVID last year. Um, so, so I still get those outlets, not as much as I used to, but the impact that I have is just so much greater. And that's just, this is awesome to me. Yeah. Yeah. And you feel like the, perhaps the impact, is there something about that that gets you excited? Like knowing that you were involved in a creative process that triggered a reaction um, is when it, when it comes to marketing, is it often what you predicted or is it most often uh, a completely different outcome from, from what the plan was? What I've realized is that the better you understand people, and their mm -hmm. cultural dynamics that govern their behavior, and you understand the conditions of the environment where you find them, then you can start pulling at the levers of the environment in such a way that people will adopt behavior to a high degree of probability. It's never 100% because yeah. you get to factor in randomness uh, that you can't control, but like people are really predictable, really, really, really predictable. Um, and if you understand the governing operating system that is culture, that influences or informs how they behave in the world and how the environment 
influences how they show up in the world, man, like it's a really powerful thing. And thinking about what marketing has done uh, for us as a society, it's, it, it's more powerful than most albums could ever have, right? Like, mm. you know, like we proposed with a diamond, at least here in the States, because of a marketing campaign. And it's been yeah. that way since the 1930s with De Beers. That's unbelievable, right? In the States, we smile when we take photos, not because it's something we always done. In fact, it was believed that smiling in photos mean that you were like a half wit. It was, it was a <laughs> sign of like, seriously, it was a sign of like low social status uh, for you to just smile in, in photos, right? Until Kodak told us that, no, 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 photos are about joyous moments. You smile in photos. And now we say cheese when we smile. Like that kind of impact, man, it's, there are only a handful of albums of artists who have that kind of impact on the world. And that I just felt was just more powerful. Um, and thankfully I had a, a better opportunity to do that and get better at that than I was and could as a musician. Yeah, which I think you bring up some good points that, you know, talking to De Beers, you know, obviously people just, like you said, they wore uh, gold rings before that. And they introduced that diamonds are forever, which is just probably the best tagline or uh, motif of all time when it comes to branding yeah. and marketing. And then, you know, looking at Kodak, that's one I didn't know about. I didn't know that the, the uh, smiling myth you were half with prior to Kodak, um, <laughs> which I think is, which is brilliant. But yeah, like you said, the cultural imprint that these campaigns can leave on the world is quite substantial. What would you say, like looking at the music industry, because that's something I'm not familiar with, but time to time, I do get people asking me um, on Instagram, they might be a rapper or they might, you know, be some type of musician. And they ask me questions such as like, Dane, how can I grow? Um my my like as a beginner musician what can what can someone in that position do to help effectively cultivate their branding they don't have potentially access to these big firms do, do you think that there's things that are happening that are trending right now in the music space that people can deploy um as as a startup musician so i'd say the 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 factors are still very much the same it always has been it's uh the stories that are told in the music and the story of the artist. Mm. It's, it's really what we, what we fall in love with. It's not just the music itself, it's the story, the mythology. Just like we do any other brand, the mythology of the brand is what we lean into. As social animals, we use stories as a way to communicate values, beliefs. Uh, a community is fostered based on the stories that we tell, the narratives that we tell. And we there's great music, Plenty, plenty of great music in the world, um, but it's the stories, not just in the songs, but in the artists that we find ourselves falling, falling in love with. So I tell those artists who are up and coming, right? The, the first man is like, what, what do you believe? Like, what's the story? Like, not like just your backstory, but like, mm. what's the narrative about you? What's the mythology about you? Um, and knowing that getting fans today, it's the gift and the curse. On one end because it's so noisy that breaking through is really hard. And therefore uh, amassing people doesn't really happen very fast. Instead, you gotta go door to door. The good thing about door to door is that the people who show up, they are really there because they really wanna be there. Wow, you know? yeah. And that, and you know, back in the day for musicians that meant playing clubs, small clubs, playing small theaters, like winning a, fran a fan a night. Like that's what it's always been. You win a fan a night, just getting fans, you know, day after day, you hit the road, you're on the road, you're amassing an audience. And then you had this media machine known as radio, known as music videos that record labels helped, uh, help finance and subsidize to grow the audience, right? To grow uh, the reach and hopefully, People will line up because they like the songs and then they dig dig the story. Those things have always been the case for music, always. Like mm -hmm. the artist that we love is not just the songs. We buy into the story. Like Frank Ocean, love Frank Ocean, huge Frank Ocean fan, right? It's the story of Frank Ocean that people really dig, especially when he launched Channel Orange and he wrote the, the Tumblr letter revealing that he was gay. Like, whoa, this is not just an art. This is... You know, this is a, a singer in hip hop who was part of Odd Future, uh, cool with Jay-Z and Kanye and yada, yada, and he's gay. What was going on? It's the story there uh, made this a, a, a much more complex 
uh, scenario than just someone who can sing really well. Mm. Like, what's the story? What's the story, man? People yeah, love stories. I guess like when I turn on MTV and I turn on MTV quite often, you know, because I like to see what's happening in music. And I think music is a really great place where you can kind of see what's happening culturally. Yeah. Um, and I feel like right now, like the, I don't get as connected to music as I did as, as a kid growing up, you know, listening to Jay-Z, listening to Eminem, listening to hip hop. There was always a story. Whereas now it seems that um, a, a lot of that is lost. And, and, and I feel like it's, it's, uh, it's almost like that's the thing that that music is uh, really great at is storytelling. And that's, that's what I grew up with. And that's where the trend is changing right now is everyone's trying to get quickly, they're cr- trying to quickly get attention. But yeah. you're saying that the ones that, uh, that last a long time that, that do have the ability to, like you said, go stage to stage, win a fan a night. I love that. I think, you know, people can apply that to social media too, because social media is just about try to win a fan every day through your that's content. Right. So when it comes to, yeah, developing the brand um, as a musician, you're saying that the story is the most important ingredient to, to scaling that brand. Yeah, because what is a brand? A brand is a signifier that conjures up thoughts and feelings about a company, product, person, organization, or entity, right? Mm -hmm. It's a signifier that is something with meaning that conjures up thoughts and feelings. Well, what conjures up thoughts and feelings more than a story does? Yeah. The most evocative thing, right? Memory structures are established because of the stories that we tell. Our identity is a story that we tell ourselves about the world and how we fit into the world. Right? We're mm. storytellers, right? We're storytelling animals, as, yeah. as, as one, one, one says, right? We love a good story. Um, so, of course, brands that tell great stories are the ones that we find ourselves leaning into, right? The mythology, right? It, 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 those are how we establish memory structures and, and spark uh, the, these emotional chords that get people to move. And ultimately, yeah. that's our job as marketers, getting people to adopt behavior, whether you're, uh, whether you're a consumer packaged good, you're an artist, you're an activist, a politician, whatever the occupation is, the, the goal is to get people to adopt behavior. And I don't know yeah. any power, any more powerful vehicle to do that than the stories that we tell. I mean, we teach religion through stories. In, mm. in, in, in tribes, we, we, we use folklore right, to, 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 to get people to act a certain way and act a way that is normal. We tell kids not to lie by telling the story about uh, the boy who cried wolf. Like these are stories that we tell to establish memory structures and also evoke emotion, which ultimately get people to adopt behavior. Yeah, and so with the, with the storytelling as, you know, looking at any type of branding, um, you're saying the stories, people, obviously they can relate to them better. There's parts of the brain that, that really can adopt um, the feeling, the sense of familiarity, the sense of we share a similar moral compass, you know, so when you're working with these big companies like the New York Nets, Budweiser, Google, and, and, and so on, how can, how, how have you found it to be effective to build stories into big brands like that? Like, what's the difference between being a musician, sharing your story and being a corporation and trying to build story into, into your branding? It's the exact same thing. It's the stories that we tell. I mean, again, this a brand is a signifier that conjures up thoughts and feelings about a mm. person, product, company, organization, institution, or whatever. It's like we're all dealing with the same sort of source material. And that source material, to your point, is how we cognate. It's the physics of cognition, of, of cogn- cognitions, the physics of how we think, right? And the part of the brain is associated with what we feel is also part of the brain associated with behavior, right? the limbic system, right? So it yeah. makes sense that if we activate the limbic system, i.e. emotions, trust, love, loyalty, all that gushy stuff that relationships are made of, then people are more inclined to adopt behavior. Well, how do we do that? We start with the soul and end with the cell, as one person says it, right? You start yeah. with the soul. Like you communicate to the soul. And how do we do that? Through the stories that we tell, evocative stories. We, we you know, we communicate... You know, this is how I say it, you know, what do we believe? What's, mm-hmm. what's the gospel as we believe it? And then the idea then is that we find the people who see the world the way we do, right? Who share the same outlook on life. And then we preach the gospel. And how was the gospel preached, right? Even Jesus spoke in parables, yeah. stories. We're storytellers, man. It's just it's stories. It just it doesn't get any better than that. Um, I think that 
the brands who know this best are the ones that continue to win over and over and over again. Yeah, I'm thinking back to like, you know, one of, one of, the, one of the individuals that first got me uh, interested in personal development, which was Jim Rohn. And Jim Rohn would always share stories from the Bible. And I remember all of them. Um, and it was, you know, potentially stories that aren't necessarily something that really happens, but it's a parable or it's a metaphor. And I think our minds are able to recall and remember those things a lot easier than it can factual information. That's so right. you're saying that if a brand wants to get a message out into the world, you know, you could, you could make a claim of like our products are this, and these are the features and these are the benefits and so forth, which is okay, but it's not going to be as uh, cognitively um, adopted as much as sharing a story because sharing a exactly. good story, it'll, it'll, like you said, cultural contagion will start to happen and it'll start to ripple through our culture. So talking to your, um, which is something you've coined, which is cultural contagion, like what exactly is that and how can someone uh, apply that to themselves, to their own business? Sure thing. So, you know, I, it was a, some research that I did some almost 10 years ago now uh, with a colleague of mine. And we were thinking a lot about virality, like things, quote unquote, going viral. And man, that was like 2013, 2012, viral was the word. And, you know, we thought- I, I remember it was, a, it was the buzzword for such a long time. How do I go such viral? Such a long time, man. How do I Everything, get things to happen? <laughs> how do we go yeah. viral? How do we go viral? And, you know, what we realized is that the- language that we use virality was actually falling short of what people were looking for virality is the spread from person to person right it's it is the spread from person to person to person and we would look at a video that would go viral an idea that would go viral and virality would be it would be um measured by how many times it got seen how many times it got shared or how many times it spread, right? And the idea is that it was not enough just for things to spread. We want things to take hold. Like, as, like I don't want people to just talk about my new product. I want people to actually go buy it. I want people just to, you know, talk about my new restaurant. I want them to actually go to it. I want people to just talk about my new movie. I want them to actually watch it, right? Just, it's more than just spreading. It's people taking action. And that's what we thought about. Well, it's not just, this isn't just virality. This is the contagion, like a pathogen spreads from person to person. This is a pathogen that spreads from person to person to person and ultimately takes hold. And what, what the literature has, has proven to us, or at least strongly suggested, that even using virality, like the medical virality, a medical pathogen, as a way to describe how behavior is uh, propagated is actually not a real strong analogy. Just considering how much it takes for us to actually be infected by a pathogen, right? That is, simple contagion is, if I sneeze on you, what I have, you will likely be susceptible to. And yeah. if your immune system is compromised anyway, it's a good chance you're going to get what I get, right? One to one. However, if I told you about a show, and you're like, oh, thanks, Marcus. Doesn't mean you're going to go watch the show right away. Mm -hmm. But if you heard it from me, heard it from someone else, you saw them talk about it over here, and it's on your news feed, and all these different touch points, that is the redundant connection or the re redundant exposure is more inclined to get you to move, right? It's, it's complex contagion. So it's like, oh, okay, this isn't about virality. This is about contagion, but cultural contagion in that it impacts or takes hold into the beliefs that we have the artifacts that we don, what we wear, the behaviors we take on, language that we use, those things, behaviors, beliefs, mm -hmm. artifacts, language are the, 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 the characteristics of, of culture. And that's really what we're after, how these things spread from person to person to person. Yeah, I mean, if you look at, like I'm thinking about Nike for some reason right now, and you think about Nike, people don't even think about the shoes, right? Um, they think about what it, means and how it feels and you know and, and the culture that comes along with it and it's almost like if you go and buy a pair of nikes from the shop um you know it's it's unlikely you just saw an ad and decided to buy it you're saying that you know maybe you've seen michael jordan fly through the air and you've seen an advertisement on television you've seen your friends who is someone you look up to wearing a pair and and then the, like you said the contagion starts to take root in in your belief system then you start thinking you know to get Nikes means I'm cool. It means that I, I'm a part of that culture. It means I believe what Michael Jordan believes. 
So this is what you're talking about, like really having people not only just see your ad, but download it and install it as a part of their identity. That's right. Memory structures become established. Those memory structures are, are relevant to how yeah. they see themselves. And I use the brand not just for its utility, but I use it as a way to communicate who I am in the world, to demarcate the, the, the place that I fit into this world, which is what we do with all the material brands that we own. I mean, that this is actually the important part about consumption. Grant McCracken puts it this way, he's an anthropologist. He says, consumption helps us make our culture material. And he's so right. Like we buy things to, to make our culture real, to realize it as a way to express it to the world. And when brands and their beliefs, their meaning is, a, is congruent with our beliefs and our identity, the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves and how we fit into this world, we use these brands to communicate something about who we are, right? It's why mm -hmm. you'll never see me wear a MAGA hat ever. Why? Because what it means is not congruent with my identity. Yeah, exactly. And I, and I appreciate that. Um, and so when you're talking about memory, like in that manner, like what exactly do you mean? Like, could you, could you break that down a little bit more for me and how you see memory as a, as a crucial ingredient to building good branding? Totally. So memory structures, these are, I, I refer to as the cognitive real estate that things own in our brains, right? Mm. This is, you know, um, Kahneman talks about we live in system, we process in system one and system two thinking. System one thinking, very fast, very truncated, like shortcut, autopilot uh, sort of decisions, right? Really fast without even thinking, we can make those decisions. Then system two thinking is the longer, more deliberate thinking. And we make the majority, disproportionate majority of our decisions in this like fast system one thinking. Well, what's informing those system one thinking? It's the memory structure. It's the cognitive grooves that we've established for a particular thing. For instance, when you first started driving, what did you do? You said, okay, hands at 11 and two, make sure you buckle up, make sure you fix the mirrors, turn down the music. Like you did all these things when you first started driving, right? Because there weren't a lot of memory structures associated. But the more you started driving, the less you did those things. So much so that now you drive, you're probably on the phone and you're text messaging and the music's blasting, you're doing all these different things because you can allocate that cognitive energy to other things. These are the memory structures that we establish. Then we talk about things, we talk about that saying uh, practice makes perfect was well, not really true. It's actually practice makes patterns and patterns make routine. So mm. when we think about brands through that construct, we have cognitive real estate that brands own in our minds. These are the memory structures that they own. And while we're making these shortcut decisions, when our memory structures are out of sync with what the brand is mentioning to us, we're like, whatever. And the decisions we make on a regular basis are informed by that system one thinking, which is based upon the memories that we have established. Yeah. So essentially like good branding is about creating continuously good memories for a consumer until the point they start really adopting and, and, and adhering to, to utilizing the well, brands or is there I more to say, it than that? I would say a, the, the effects of good branding is mm. a memory. aid. Right. It's a memory. Yeah. Aid. So when yeah. I see the, the locus of, when I see the, the, the mark of ownership, mm -hmm. these things start to flood in my brain. They sort of feel a certain way these memories start to be conjured. And because, and based on what those memories are and those feelings are, I behave a certain way. Yeah. Right? It's almost this like the, the, the thousands of, of thousands of Coca-Cola commercials that we've seen. When you see the Coca-Cola logo, you start, you know, feeling parched. You want to, you, you certainly feel thirsty. You want a sugar hit. You see people dancing right. in the sunshine. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. So yeah, you're saying that, um, I guess the effects of good branding is, is having something that is memorable that people can really, um, include as a part of their as a part of their ecosystem as their moral belief, their moral compass, how they live, what they promote, who they are, and you could you could argue that people wear brands that they align with because they're trying to promote this is who I am. It's a signif signifier. Like for me, That's I'm right. a Mighty Ducks fan. I love the I freaking love the Mighty Ducks, and I'm so glad that they're bringing it back. Um, <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> I'm advocating that, I'm promoting that to the world. Yeah. Um, so so for you, like obviously you've had a, such a deep well of of experience with this. 
And the one thing that fascinates me is um, the, the, the dichotomy between, you know, when I started as freelancing, I was working with my friends and family. And then it started to circle out into strangers. And then it started to be small starting businesses, like people that had bootstrap budgets. And now my agency is moving to a place where it was, you know, people that had medium sized businesses. Now we're working with companies that, you know, that they have um, the net value of, you know, $100, $180 million. So That's like for great. me, I've, I've seen that the tier and the shifts culturally between these types of clientele. So for you, having worked with, you know, these massive companies like Google, Microsoft, Jeep, um, and Budweiser and so on, what, what do you think of their, these big corporations are deploying right now in, in the branding world? You know, I know that um, having a brand manager is a reasonably new thing of the past decade, but, you know, working at Widen and Kennedy, what have you seen shifts in, in that space in recent years as everything's moving digital? So I think a so brand has been around for a, a long time. And the idea of managing or stewarding a brand it, it's, it's not new. I think what has become a challenge is the additional ways by which the brand is signaled to mm. people and the lack of agency that marketers have over those channels. I mean, ultimately, right. you know, I, this is what I tell my team at Wyden, and this is you know, what, what I preach, that it, when we talk about branding, it's all about meaning making. What does it mean? This is, what does it mean, right? It's a signifier that conjures up thoughts and feelings. Signifier is a meaning-making vehicle. What does it mean? So meaning is not owned or created by a company. It's signaled by a company. Right. We, people, we make meaning based on what we hear from the company. We go, okay, well, let me, let me think that through. And then we hear these people talk about it. We hear those people talk about it. These people talk about it. And, you know, uh, like newspapers and magazines talk about it. And people who are tastemakers of the day, right? Uh, high esteemed, how they talk about it, how they use it. People are fringe, how they talk about it, how they use it. How our people talk about it, how they use it. And these things impregnate brands and branded products with meaning. And then we mm. go, okay, let me reconcile that with my identity. Right, And I go, nah, not for me. I'll go, oh, this is totally for me based upon the identity project that I want to express to the world. The challenge with that is that brands only really have control over their media that they can signal media or signal meaning. Right. But through social networking platforms, our friends are signaling meaning in a far more pervasive way than ever before. Not only our friends, but just general people we don't even know prolifically are signaling meaning about brands and branded products. And for marketers, it, it takes away agency, right? Like it's not just, you know, we talk about like, oh man, the technology changes everything. No, it hasn't. It's not the technology. This is how it's always been. There's just more opportunities for meaning to be signaled. And therefore, mm -hmm it creates a harder job for marketers to try to make meaning in the minds of people. Yeah, when, when you say it's more difficult to agency, what, what do you mean exactly by that? Oh, it's like the, the, the marketers don't have ownership as much. Like they don't yeah. control newspapers and magazines. They don't control yeah. what people post on social networking platforms. They don't control how, uh, how celebrities, influencers, regular Joe Schmoes interact with or talk about the brand. They don't control those things. And these things have a disproportionate impact on how we make meaning, especially the peer fashioning system. This is actually my, my doctoral work uh, was done in this. This is, you know, I, I studied meaning making and cultural contagion, right? How brands mm -hmm. brand products spread within a community of people who subscribe to the same cultural characteristics. And what the research found is that a lot of this is fashioned by people like us, our peers, our friends, right? These are the people that we use to self-identify, by which we self-identify, communicate who we are in the world, and we are influenced by what they do. So when they talk about a brand or branded product, it influences how we see it and how we act. And for a marketer, they don't have much control over that. 
Right. Whereas if you look in the past, maybe let's go back, you know, to the 1980s, 70s and 80s, predominantly it was who owned the billboards, who owned television, who owned radio, who owned the newspapers as, as a media buyer. And then these media companies could sell these packages to companies like, you know, Budweiser and, and Jeep and so on. But now you're saying that it's so easy for people to access a, a, a place where they can signal something, anyone, like you said, any Joe Shimura can get on Instagram and start posting content or the same goes for YouTube or Spotify and, you know, SoundCloud, people can upload their own music and so on. You're saying that now there's so many people signaling that it's, it's, um, I, I don't mean this in a negative context, but perhaps polluting the industry. So it's even more difficult for brands to take hold. Yeah. I would, I would say that there are more opportunities for people to, move meaning from the culturally constituted world that we live in and impregnate into products. Right. Okay. I mean, so if they, they take movies, for instance, right? So yeah. back in the day, 20 years ago, which sounds crazy, but 20 years ago, you heard about the movie by the marketing arm of the movie studio, right? Mm. Best movie coming out. Siskel and Eber says it's great. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then like a magazine will write about it right? Or a newspaper will write about it. And maybe uh, some of the actors will get on television and say, oh, this is the best work I've done in my life. I'm so excited about this thing. And maybe it's about a particular sort of genre. And you've got like, you know, this fringe group of people who are talking about that genre. That's how meaning was made or signal, right? right? Yeah. Those different vehicles, this advertising fashion system, this uh, newspaper fashion system, the uh, uh, high, high esteemed fashion system, fringe society fashion system were the ways by which the culture constituted world that we live in, meaning was taken from that and impregnated into products, brands and branded products. With the advent of the internet and social networking platforms, there becomes a predominantly more dominant uh, fashion systems, the peer fashion system, mm -hmm. that a movie comes out, I saw it the first day it comes out, I'm like, this is so whack, don't go see it, it's the worst. And yeah, so I was really interested to go see it, man, so was I. I saw the trailer and I loved it, <sighs> whack, let me review it for you. And now these things are signaling meaning about the product. Yeah, and That's just the value of it. There's also the signaling meaning of like, those guys racist, don't buy from them, or you know, uh, people who wear that, then you're lame. Like all, like all these things are being mediated by people. Yeah. And so you say it's almost like peer pressure in high school. Like, don't, have, don't do that. That's lame. Yeah. But, but this is what we do though. It, it actually helps us. Like we rely on people in this way. This is how we collectively evaluate and legitimate what is acceptable. Mm. And there's a lot of great value in that, right? Like it's great, great value in that. This is you know, what the literature refers to as, as social learning, right? This is collective intelligence. Great, awesome. We're better because of it. But yeah. for a marketer, whew, it, it creates some challenges. So we have to think about the, the, the tableau of the media landscape on how are all the many ways we might be able to signal meaning so yeah. that when people see the signal, they go, oh, okay, cool. I, I dig that. We got meaning congruence. People start using the brand to communicate their identity. Yeah, so you're saying that the that for a company to navigate versus 20 years ago is more skewed toward, hey, what are, the, what are people going to say about this? How is a collective tribe of individuals that share cultural belief, how are they going to discuss this with one another? Is this right. going to land with that with that tribe of people? You know, back to Seth Godin, he talks about you know building tribes, and, and I think he, he talks about it really well. So you're saying that because of that shift with social media, that's introduced a lot more collective peer reviewing versus um, you know a monopolization, if you will, over the media. So now that everyone can be a voice, um, it's made it more difficult to navigate. But also at the same time, I've seen it happen where brands that were very small have exploded because of peer support so it's had right. the other it's had that other dichotomy of where it's it's really worked in a lot of brands favors and you're seeing billion dollar companies close down and small companies become billion dollar companies almost right. overnight 
because and, because and people it's love it. Yeah. It's not a new no. thing. Like to your point, it's not a new thing. It's just more pervasive because the technology extends the behavior. Yeah. The technology accelerates it. But we've always done this. It's just that I didn't have as much access to it, right? My friends at school will, will talk about it if they saw it. And maybe my cousin, a weak tie, my cousin who goes to another school was like, oh, my, my friends all saw the movie. It was great. Or all my friends are wearing these. Now I'm I, now I'm wearing them. Like, oh, now I should be wearing them. Like, so these things have happened. This has always been the case. This isn't new. The technology hasn't made a new phenomenon. Mm. What it does, what it has done rather is accelerated thanks to the zeros and ones. Right. generate process and store data for us yeah and allow us bad, bad pr and good pr and pr in general has been around for a long time but what you're saying is that's yeah. that process is are sped up dramatically now that's where right. things are coming out almost instantaneous people are reviewing things almost instantaneously like if you look at um the video game company cyberpunk and the hype behind that and then the 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 just sheer uproar from the gaming community in spite of what was launched then that kind of plummeted their sales because people were like well if my friend's not going to play it i'm not even going to purchase it but that's happening that's like right. immediately whereas yeah like 20 years ago that would take maybe weeks or months uh, for that that's to right. take place that's yeah. right yeah there's just so many avenues to signal meaning so many of it right mm. that the brand says it's great you know the the newspaper says oh this is kind of cool or magazine you know uh the brand says this is gonna be the coolest thing ever all the cool kids are doing it complex says well it's all right. It's kind of cool. Um, Charlemagne the God on the Breakfast Club goes, ah, I'm not rock with that so much. It's actually kind of lame. And my friends are like, oh, I don't know about that, fam. Now the meaning I have associated, those memory structures that I have associated with that goes, I think it's so cool. I'm not doing it. And that's how culture moves forward. Do people like me do something like this? The answer is yes, I do it. The answer is no, I don't. And Culture is the governing operating system of man. And culture is a realized meaning-making system. It's the way by which we make meaning in the world based upon the beliefs that we hold, the artifacts that we don, the behaviors that are normative, and the language that we use. Yeah. And, and I think, like you said, it's just the cultural uh, ripple effects of what's happening now is really interesting. So looking at your position at Wyden and Kennedy, like, you know, um, your title there is, is head of planning. What exactly does that mean? And what, what are you involved in with, with, um, in, with them in New York? Yeah, so head of planning is essentially chief strategy officer uh, in the New York office. So Wyden Kennedy is a network agency, right? We have eight, eight, eight agencies across the network, uh, New York, Portland, Shanghai, Tokyo, Sao Paulo, London, New Delhi, and probably, I said Tokyo already, right? Shanghai, uh, it's like eight of them, eight of them. Um, and then up, of course, New York. I run strategy in the New York office. So uh, that's brand strategy, social strategy, and comms strategy all, all roll up to me. And it's my job to help us, to help us see the truth, to help us see the truth by understanding how people make meaning. And as we get to the truth, then we can inform uh, a point of view for the brand, a conviction, an ideology, a way of seeing the world and how the brand might show up in the world in, in, a, in a way that is congruent with the meaning that we are trying to signal to the world. Yeah. And um, so yeah, when you're working with these clients and you're, you're doing these strategy sessions and you're really trying to help them laser focus in on, you know, how, to, how exactly do they deploy this storytelling, uh, creating these memories, creating this cultural imprint in the marketplace? What do you think are some of the most effective touch points at this point in time? Are you guys spending a lot of time with social media? Are you talking a lot about collaboration with other businesses? Like how, how are you deploying um, effective strategies at this point in time in the, in the digital age for these big, these big companies? You know, it really depends. What, what, what I always talk about is like, I don't care about the outputs as much as I do the outcomes. I mean, we're ultimately designing for a behavioral adoption. And the mm -hmm. idea is, what are the what's the best way that we can curate the environment by which we where which we find people, uh, so that when they are when they're impacted by it, when they see it, they take action. For some for some people, that may be a banner. For some, it's a tweet. For others, it's a TV spot. For some, it's an out of home or an aggregate of some of those, right? Some some permutation of of multiple touch points. The idea is less about what are we going to create but more about what are we going to get people to do? 
Mm. And what, what cognitive things do we have to overcome to get people to do that? Now, how do we create stimuli, catalysts, dis disruptions, right? Uh, disasters, if you will, um, <laughs> in effort to get people to take on behavior. So uh, like as a, as a business owner who, who is thinking about, okay, like, you know, I, I have to figure out how am I going to scale my company? How am I going to grow this thing? You're saying that a good place to potentially start is looking at what outcome you want to create in the market. What do you want people to adopt? Um, in what way and what manner do you want the culture to, to install itself? And then from that point, is that where you start linking in? Okay, these touch points would be very effective for this particular outcome that you're searching? Sure, sure. I mean, yeah. it's, it's as simple as what do you believe? Who are the people who believe what you believe? Go preach the gospel to them. Mm. Now, how do you preach the gospel? Well, it depends. Do you use social networking platforms? Do you use television? Do you use print out of home? Well, it depends on the people. It depends on their consumption habits. It, can, it depends on um, you know, how they interact with, with information. Like, what are the things What's in their world that they experience? What are all the touch points that's going to get them to adopt the behavior that you want them to adopt? And you design for that it's it's like choice architecture in a lot of ways but it, yeah. it's 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 um the the idea is simple but it's not easy to do which yeah. is why i have a job yeah which is where we've collaborated we've done brand strategy work together and we've collaborated right. on some different projects so from um from from where you're from where you're viewing things which is which is very much i'm looking at you and i admire i buy your work marcus because I, I hope someday I can be in a, in a similar position as yourself where I'm working with particular individuals like you are. For you, like when you're working on brand strategy, like how long is that process? Is it, does it vary quite a lot? Is it, is it a half a day, a full day? Is it an ongoing back and forth thing? Like how do you navigate that? It depends. I think when it's at its best, there is a marriage between um, instinct and observation, right? Like, you know, we observe the world. Like, we, we go, like if we're trying to understand meaning, then we have to go talk to people. We got to observe people, see pe the discourse, right? We dare ourselves in the discourse, see how people talk and how they make meaning of the world and what the product means, the category means to them. And, 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 and then apply, like, and then we make some sense of it, you know, based upon what we've experienced in the world and our instinct, our gut, like, and sometimes that's fast. Like, oh man, it's this, this, got it, boom. And that may be a day, you know, and, you know, when we're responsible, it can happen fairly quickly, but other times getting at the truth is hard. I mean, cause you know, when it comes to studying people and society and culture, you know, you're looking at one thing stand in for something else, right? I'm looking at a thing, but this means a different thing to people, mm -hmm. right? So understanding what this is standing in for oftentimes takes a lot of work. I mean, academics spend months. Right? I, I, I took me, took me three years to write a dissertation on my work on how we make meaning of things. Right. So it all, it all, it all depends, man. I yeah. wish it were simple, but it's, it, it's, I think, I, I, I think of it this way. It is, uh, it's messy, but it's rich as opposed to it being tidy and empty. Right. So you're, you're saying that oftentimes when, when you're working through these strategies, it can be messy. It can be a lot of noise, a lot of to and fro. And, and from my experience, sometimes, you know, you have certain perspectives and egos and so on, and you're trying to navigate the individual of the C-suite team that are in front yeah. of you and also take into account what's actually happening in the real world. And you got to connect those dots so that they can understand what That's you're right. looking at with them not having your experience in the way you look at things creatively. Um, yeah. So how do you find that in those situations where you are, and this is a personal question, just selfishly, like when you are working with a C-suite team, what are some things that you utilize to help them uh, see the world, the way you're looking at things, you know, so they can, they can wear your goggles, so to speak, and, and see your creativity and, and, and why you're making certain decisions on their behalf. I give them the lens of the people, you know, yeah. I, I, I start off with like, so let's talk about meaning. Here's what you intend to mean. You say you believe this, and we communicate that in this matter, in this matter. Mm -hmm. Cool. But we're saying these things. Here's how people see that. And I just right. play, I just play, I just play the receipts, like play the tapes, run, run film, 
right? And you, you see people talk like, oh, when I think about this brand, it's kind of like, uh, it's me or, uh, you know, like when, when C-suite people hear it, they go, oh, wow. Like they almost like, they're not used to hearing the truth. Yeah. You know? So what we're doing is we're bringing them truth. Like, you know, <laughs> some people like your brand, but like by and large, in a lot of, in, in most cases, it's really transactional, mm. right? And that's super scary. Like if I'm, if I were running a business, running one of these big companies and realize that my relationship with my consumers is purely transactional, I know that disruption is right around the corner. Mm. If you're only rocking with me because my razor is sharper, soon someone's going to have a sharper razor with more razors and it's going to vibrate and like tweak at you when you use it and I'm screwed, which means then I got some work to do. And that, that sort of truth can be sobering, uh, mm. but also it can, it can catalyze you to say, okay, let's do something about this. Yeah, so it's almost saying like, oh, we have the best products or we believe we have the best products. It's almost like, hey, consumers don't care that much as you, as you may think. Yeah. That's right. Well, they, right. well, they like, might the maybe- sales are up. We're doing really well. <laughs> yeah. It's like, well, well yeah, because you got the best razor right now. Yeah. Until you don't. And keep it real, there are a lot of branded products that are inferior to other products. People buy the inferior one because of what it means. Mm. Right? Like, I, I, I have an iPhone, right? I'm an, I'm an Apple guy. I've always been an Apple guy. Right. Um, yeah, me too, man. I don't, you'll ever, I don't think you'll ever catch me dead with a Samsung in my pocket. <laughs> yeah. Even yeah. though I know that Samsung features and benefits have been better than the iPhone for a long time. In fact, all mm. the new things that the iPhones have brought to, to market, Samsung's have done that year, at least a year prior. But mm. I ain't never going to have a Samsung in my pocket because I'm an Apple mm. guy. It means something beyond the value propositions and this yeah. is the power of brand like the memory aids we talked about proxy for quality basis for differentiation locus for emotion and ultimately there is a price premium not just price as far as money but price as far as attention social capital uh mind space i mean like yo brands are superman powerful think about the one of the biggest brands in the world biggest brands in the world you could say that the United States is a pretty powerful brand. Oh, yeah. Okay. I see what you're saying. Yeah. Huge brand. Like, yeah, you know, there are memory aids associated with it. There are thoughts and feelings that are conjured up when you think about it. The United Patriotism. States means something. Exactly. Yeah. It means yeah. something. It means yeah. something. Catholic Church, big brand. Like, it means something, right? It means something. And as things come out about the Catholic Church that have been unsavory, people's meaning frames about Catholicism has shifted so much so that people have been leaving the church. Mm. Why? Because what the brand now means is out of line with my identity and therefore right. can't do Super. it. I mean, this is Superman powerful, man. Super yeah. Powerful. Yeah. I, I would love to ask you a question and, and this has um, been a debate in our community for a little while now. And I just love your thoughts on it. And like, I've been diving through the research of the advertising space and just the way that words we use. I mean, branding has been around, let's be real, since like, you know, uh, ages of old of, you know, the Egyptians yeah. branding their cows and potter makers right. putting their, their right. mark on pottery and so forth. But I guess the word branding didn't really take root until, you know, we're looking at the fifties onwards. Prior mm -hmm. to that, it was always about advertising and marketing, essentially. Yes. Um, you know, my, my, my perspective, and, and this could be wrong, and I'm, I'm open to being wrong, but my perspective is that advertising has evolved into branding. Like it's, it's in, in, a, in a way, whereas advertising was about having a clear, concise signal, a clear, concise message that meant yeah. something to a consumer, the consumer would adopt it and then buy the product. Now we're using branding in that place where I guess advertising has a bad outfit and has been demonized is that it's all about selling. Hmm. Could you, could you argue that now branding, cause I have this conversation daily where people come to me, they go, I need to build a brand. I go, why? I need to sell. It's all, it's, it's very, it, you know what I mean? It's not about like, oh. I want to share my message. It's like, I want to get freaking conversions. Yeah. So would you say that, that branding in, in some regard is evolved out of our distaste for how we perceive 
advertising as a brand is if you say advertising was a brand it's kind of faded out in a bad way branding's taken its place or would you say that there's it's more complicated than that i i think it's probably somewhere in the middle so okay. branding by its very nature is a long-term play we talk about memory mm -hmm. structures right memories take time for a develop we're talking about conjuring thoughts and feelings it takes time to develop we're talking about uh making connections with people that takes time to develop sales are very short-term extremely short-term it's transactional um, right so the idea like uh, some research has been done i think you've, the, the book's called uh the short of it uh the long and short of it is that like you have to think about the long term and the short term like you build for the future and you think about transactions mm. and it's the combination of the two that leads to like powerful powerful marketing and to your point, branding isn't a new thing, right? The etymology of branding, I think, I think it has German roots um, and it's about to burn, right? To mark, branding irons um, as an example, right? So it's about the mark. In fact, if you look at, um, if you look at the, the word brand and you translate into like French, Croatian, Spanish, uh, German, it all sounds like mark. So brand okay, is like wow. mark A, mark, yeah. right? brand is mark, right? Um, so this idea of branding, like branding cattle, is mm. a mark of ownership. And when the first incorporated brands, the 1700s, Wedgwood, Pottery Brand, mark of ownership, right? And brand at that point was all about, uh, it was a legal mark. This belongs to me, mark of ownership. Right. Um, but over time, as, as brands do, as anything does, the more we start to rely on it, it becomes something that we trust. So it moved from mark of ownership to like a, a, a legal mark to a trust mark. Mm. And then as you start trusting things, you start to develop feelings for it. And we move from, from trust mark to love mark, which is like the book that everyone loves, yada, yada, yada. Um, but what I say is that the most powerful evolution of brand is identity mark. It's a right, mark okay. of identity. It's a way of mm. signaling who, who we are in the world, which I think surpasses all of those things. That doesn't happen in the short term. So sales never get to that. This happens over time. And advertising today, I think, has realized that it's more than just getting people's attention, which is what the etymology of advertising is, to advert. Okay. Look over here. Pay attention to this. Check this out. And we did that as a selling vehicle. I think what marketers realized over time, like, like I said, late 50s, we started using psychology as a way to understand consumer behavior or consumer insights, we started thinking about memory structures and what brand can do. And like people saying, oh, I know that brand and therefore I can associate all these other things to it, these feelings and thoughts that come to mind mm. and realizing that these things can have long-term effects, which is great. Then we want to invest in this and also uh, push people to consume today. And advertising becomes a, a dual play. We need to get people going, right? Repetition to get people thinking, oh yeah, let me go act now, right? You know, we promotions, act now, gone in 20 minutes or whatever, right? Like we use advertising to do that, but we also use advertising to establish these memory structures that are, are that are meant to be a long-term play using brand. Yeah, would, would you say that like, would you say that Abbott's like, Oh, by the way, like, sorry if my baby's screaming in the background, it's all good. but like, <laughs> um, it's, it's the world we live in now, guys, we're going to work from home. Right. But, um, but yeah, like, like, I like what you're saying before. So I'm thinking back to what you're saying about signaling and creating memory structures. Would you, would you say that, um, advertising is signaling and branding is, is when the, the signal takes hold? I would say, I would say that advertising definitely is signaling for sure. Um, I would say that brand are brand is the the things that we associate to the mark of ownership. Right, I see. And then and, and then the marketing thoughts and feelings they... that come to mind. Because look, you know, like you know, we'll see something, right? And like we're like, oh yeah, I know that product, but I don't know who owns it. It's like, oh yeah, like I, I know the I, I've seen that product before, but like, who owns that? I don't know what brand that belongs to. It's just a product, not a branded product. It's a right. So then so the advertising has worked, but the branding hasn't. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. 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 So there's some memory structures there. It's got my attention. It's memory structures there. But to who it belongs, I don't know. And you know, thoughts and feelings associated to it, even if I know who it belongs to, it's like, okay, I don't know what that even means. 
You know, if you tell a, a regular person in the street and says, oh, that product is owned by Unilever, most people go, what? Because there aren't any feelings or thoughts associated with Unilever as a signifier, right? Um, so these things really play at how we make associations, how the associations are relevant, how these memory structures are established, um, and ultimately, what are the thoughts and feelings associated with them? Yeah, and then you could, I guess you could argue that marketing is putting this whole plan together, like in, in many different fashions of the vehicles to get to get it out into the marketplace. That's right. Um, Sometimes marketing yeah. has nothing to do with any communications, right? You, there's right. plenty of marketing that has a product, there's associated price, it gets to you through some pipeline or what Jerome McCarthy called promotions, you, um, place rather, and you know those are the 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 the, the four P's which are the levers that we pull as marketers, right? So yeah. marketing advertising aren't synonymous, though we think about them as such. Uh, just like, uh, just like uh, branding and marketing communications don't necessarily have to be. Yeah, and, and I think um, you've answered this like very eloquently, like, and you've really helped me understand a lot more about advertising and its purpose, branding and its purpose and marketing. You know, we, you're hearing things at the moment, like, you know, and, and I love them. Gary Vee is just like, you know, promoting advertising is dead. I don't think so. I think it's just evolved, it's changed. It's, 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 sure. it's, it's, become, a, it's become a new thing uh, in, in many fashions. Um, but yeah, coming towards the close here today, like, I, I would just love to know, like, what's your vision of the future um, for yourself? Like, what, what do you see yourself doing in five to 10 years from now? What are you passionate about? What are you driving yourself towards that you think is, um, is something that you're going to enjoy? I think what I'm excited about is what I've always been excited about is making impact. And that impact has, I would say, in my early years have been about me making an impact on the world. Look what I've done. But since my my focus has been less about me and more about helping people. I mean, we've talked about this before. I always talk about this is uh, my Phil Jackson years. <laughs> like, you know, I used to be a player and I was excited about that and like winning chips. Love, love doing that, right? Love, love the accolades. But I think what my legacy is going to be is helping other people be great. Just like Phil Jackson was for the Bulls and again later for the Lakers, helping Jordan be Jordan, Kobe be Kobe, rest in peace. Shaq be Shaq. Like, I think that's, that's what I'm looking forward to. Um, and a lot of that's going to come from teaching. A lot of going to come from writing. A lot of going to come from, you know, sort of evangelizing, preaching the gospel um, in, in hopes of inspiring people to go, oh man, I never thought about it that way. And I can hopefully take those things, do what I do well, take those things to just level up, right? Help people realize their, their highest potential possible. Like, that's what I'm excited about. I feel like that's what so I've put on this earth to do. So hopefully, mm. preferably, inshallah, that's what the next five to 10 years or five to 10 years or however much time God gives me, uh, that's what I'll continue to do. That's beautiful. And and do you have any visions of how you would like to deploy that? Like what what things you would like to do to help people have that impact, to help give that gift of knowledge to, to others? How do you how do you intend to, to have that play out? Yes, I'm writing a book right now called For the Culture that should be in the world at the top of 2023. The manuscript is due next year, May. Uh, so I'm, I am vigorously writing. So that becomes a really good vehicle to, to, to propagate the thinking, but also like giving talks, teaching, guest lecturing, podcasts, creating content um, you know, across, across uh, my social channels, all the, the, the means by which I can go door to door and get people to go, oh man, like that was very helpful. I'm gonna keep checking this guy out. And yo, you check this guy out too. He's so helpful. Like that's that's the hope. Mm, yeah, and really well, really beautifully said. And I certainly believe that you're someone that's gonna do that. And you're already doing that. Like other conversations we've had outside of this, you're, you're always, already deploying a lot of your free time toward helping people uh, pr pretty much free. And I think that, you know, you have people understand that, the value of being involved in the community, the value of giving gifts to others and, and, and donating that time. It, the experience from that is so rich. And obviously it helps you deploy in other places like Widen and Kennedy. Um, but Marcus, you've been a, a wonderful guest. I always enjoy my conversations with you. you your lexicon and vocabulary always blows my mind. Um, how can, how can people reach out to you? How can people connect with you and how can people consume more of your content? All the social channels uh, at Mark to the C, M-A-R-C-T-O-T-H-E-C, 
also website mark to the sea.com. Uh, yeah, we'll put all the links into the description for this. Uh, but Marcus, I really do appreciate your time. I know it's late there. Thank you so much for jumping on today. And thank you so much for a fruitful and, and fun and interactive conversation about all the things that I really love selfishly. Um, but I appreciate My you pleasure. so much there. Thank you so <laughs> My much. My pleasure, brother. It's always a pleasure. Have a good night. Bye for now. Take care.